Well, my name is Emil Skeppers. I'm the International Affairs Secretary of the Communist Party USA. Uh, and with me tonight is Sarah Ladina Caro, who's part of the Colombian student group at Hunter College, New York, and is in fact speaking to us from Colombia. And we're going to do a presentation tonight on what's, what, what the concept of imperialism is, how it works, and Sarah is going to be talking about the specifics of Colombia uh, and how imperialism has played out there. And I thank the Education Department of the Communist Party USA for uh, setting this up and for, in fact, this whole excellent series of educational presentations. I thank Kerry for uh, doing the technical work tonight and also the people who signed in for this uh, it, it, it presentation. Uh, thank you for your presence. Uh, I'm going to start and give you a theoretical outline of what, what imperialism is and how it works. Uh, I am do, and then Sarah is going to get us down to the specifics of, a, of Colombia, a country that has been basically ravaged by imperialism for more than a century, uh, and uh, talk about specifically what's going on there right now. And we're doing this at a very problematic and dangerous moment. Uh, we now are beginning to see what the Trump administration is going to look like. Uh, it is an administration of big monopoly capital, no matter what Trump's pitch to the little man or his populist rhetoric to the contrary. The Secretary of State, Mr. Tillerson, is from ExxonMobil, one of the biggest and most abusive oil companies in the world. His Secretary of the Treasury is, is a big finance capital guy. His Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross, is a mining magnet. And there are no fewer than three generals in the uh, cabinet of Trump. So it's definitely a big business cabinet, uh, not a cabinet of ordinary working people. And that, that this will be somehow not an imperialistic government uh, I think is something that we need to get out of the way right to the beginning. Uh, so let me start. Uh, Carrie, if we, I can have the first slide, please. Okay, what are we trying to accomplish now? First of all, we're trying to start out with a multidimensional and historical understanding of imperialism, focusing on its economic, political, and other dimensions not just its military dimension. Secondly, we want to to raise the issue of how imperialism impacts on workers, whether they be in Colombia or China or wherever, but especially including workers in the United States because imperialism has a big impact on workers right here in the United States. Thirdly, we want to just scratch the surface, start a discussion of what workers in the United States need to do in the struggle against imperialism, uh, because it's our struggle too. Now, what isn't imperialism? First of all, it's not just intervening in other countries' affairs or sending in the Marines, although that's part of it. It's not something that the governments of the powerful, wealthy countries can switch on and off depending on who wins the election here, although there are policy choices. And it's all of those things and more, and much, much more, especially when you look at its economic dimension. Next slide, please. Carry next slide, please. Okay, let's, let's see what's the best way of attacking this concept of imperialism. When we sent out the announcement of tonight's session we strongly suggested that everybody get hold of a copy of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin's 1916 book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Great if you managed to read it before now. Uh, if not, uh, we urge you to read it uh, whenever you get a chance. And you can order a copy from international publishers uh, that you can reach on our website. Uh, now, Lenin wrote this book in 1916, smack in the middle of the First World War, Great Slaughter, and uh, 
before the Bolshevik Revolution, before the Soviet Union came into being. And his point was to explain the relationship between imperialism and capitalism at that very key historical point. Slide. Uh, first of all, he saw imperialism as coming to fruition, not as a separate or a side thing, but as another way of talking about capitalism in 1916. That's a mistake on the slide. I'll correct that before sending them out. Uh, it entails an end to real free trade. It's not free trade anymore, no matter what the rhetoric. It, it's the rise of great transnational monopolies. Uh, finance capital becomes paramount. It combines with industrial capital and finance capital in the stronger position. Capital begins to be exported, not just manufactured goods from the factories in the wealthy countries. In, in other words, in an earlier point of capitalism, uh, factories in Scotland, for instance, would produce textiles and then ship them to India and sell them there. Uh, at this point, capital itself begins to be exported with investments in the poorer countries of the world, which Lenin talks about as colonies, India at the time, and semi-colonies, semi which we could also call the poorer but independent countries. Next. Uh, now, under the imperialist system, this imperial, imperial control is exercised not only over agrarian countries, as some of Lenin's uh, contemporaries believed, but all poorer countries, no matter what their productive system, become subjected to transnational monopoly capital. Imperialism invariably involves violence. I, on the one hand, to maintain and establish imperial control, uh, the poorer countries have to be subjected to control. On the other hand, between the different countries and their, their different corporations operating out of different countries, uh, there is a propensity to competition that can lead to, to war, which is what uh, Lenin saw as the root cause of the First World War. In other words, imperialism is an integrated world-scale economic and political social system. It is the highest stage of capitalism. It's not separate from capitalism. It's capitalism at the time that itself, at the time that Lenin was writing. Next. Uh, slide, Kerry, please. Changed. Okay. Now, Lenin was writing this 100 years ago. It's the anniversary this year of the Bolshevik Revolution, and he wrote this a little before that. But there have been important changes since then. So we do need to look at imperialism in historical perspective to see how it has developed organically and where it is going. And as if we follow Lenin's de definition, we're also looking at the development of capitalism itself as we look at the development of imperialism. There had been earlier stages of imperial invasions of non-European countries by European countries. Uh, a phase that's called by Marx primary accumulation or primitive accumulation involved the stealing of massive amounts of land in the Americas and elsewhere by the European conquerors, uh, the looting of the wealth of the New World and also of South Asia, India, and other places by the, by the wealthy European states. And very importantly for us, the slave trade, which was basically stealing of people from Africa uh, to be turned into sources of great wealth in the cane fields, for instance, of Jamaica and what is now uh, Haiti and uh, other other places, the, the uh, mines of uh, many different places around the world. And one more slide. Uh, Marx said it very well, as usually, uh, as usual, on the origins of capitalism. The discovery of gold and silver in America, the extirpation, enslavement, and entombment in the mines of the Aboriginal population, the beginning of the conquest and looting of the East Indies, 
the turning of Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of blackskins, signalized the rosy dawn of the era of capitalist production. And elsewhere, he said, capitalism came into the world dripping with blood from these activities. That is the way that capitalism was built up at its earlier stage. The wealth looted in this way through slavery, through, through conquest, through highway robbery, uh, made modern capitalism and the Industrial Re Revolution uh, possible. And then this leads to the phase we call co colonialism. So, Carrie, please hold that slide. Let me just stop at this point and ask if there are any questions at this point. Uh, I, how do you ask questions? I think you have to press a little hand thing. Yes, if anyone has questions, please click on your raise hand icon. The little raised hand you press on and then, then we can hear your voice. And I'll stop. Michael Gray. Michael Gray, your microphone is open. Oh, uh. I don't know. <laughs> yes, Michael, we can hear you. Uh. Okay, Michael, uh, we are going to mute you now. Uh, Michael, we can we can try again a little later if you had a little technical problem there. I will stop a couple more times for questions, and then we'll have a bigger discussion at the end. Anybody else? Next up is Pedro uh, Carazana. Pedro, your mic is now open. Okay, Pedro. Pedro, your mic is now open. We should be able to hear you. Okay, hearing nothing from Pedro, we are going to mute. Remute. Okay, Let, let's continue. We will figure out these technical issues and, and re-invite people to speak uh, a little later. But to continue the historical outline, uh, by the end of the 19th century, we had the new phase of colonialism, uh, in which uh, major European countries, then later the United States and Japan, went and took over direct control of the of some of the poorer countries around the world which had great transformative impacts in all of those countries that came under control colonial control for instance agriculture that had just been for feeding village populations suddenly had to be changed into things like growing massive amounts of cotton for export with the profits going to European corporations uh, and other similar things in other countries. Uh, the development of extractive industries. I myself am from South Africa originally, and the story there was that to get people to work in the gold and diamond mines, and later other mining and industrial activities, the colonial regimes imposed taxes on rural African populations who didn't have money co uh, economies. So they had to pay their taxes in cash, and the only way they could earn cash was to go and wait, work in the mines outside Johannesburg or for white industry and some other, some other respects. And this was extremely disruptive, but slave labor continued as it had been under the earlier period in the Belgian Congo and some other places, the horrible situation of the rubber industry in the Congo, uh, and the looting of riches continued and continues to this day. Uh, so that's how uh, people in the poor countries were exploited, the colonial phrase of imperialism. Now, people always resisted in the poor countries. There was never a time in which there wasn't a colonial war going on somewhere because of the people of the subordinated countries fighting back after this, effectively or not. But after the Bolshevik Revolution of October 1917 and the creation of Comintern, which was the coordinating body 
of the communist parties around the world. There began to be an orientation of anti-colonial and patriotic groups in many countries around the world seeing the USSR as the source not only of moral but material support uh, in fighting for the freedom of their countries from colonialism. Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam was a person who came out of interactions with the French Communist Party and uh, there were many, many other examples like that. And Lenin always stressed and his, his successors that it didn't matter if a nationalist or anti-colonial group was socialist or Marxist, uh, if it was able to break down imperialism, uh, it should be supported by communists everywhere because to fight against imperialism was to fight against capitalism. Uh, the United States, by the way, had also got into the imperialism situation big time. Direct colonial control over the Philippines and Puerto Rico, and indirect control over the uh, over Cuba, and then uh, indirect control over many, many other countries of Latin America were features of U.S. foreign engagement in the 1920s and 1930s and going on afterwards. Uh, slide. Uh, next slide, please, Cliff Carey. Okay, got it. Yes. Okay, Second World War happens. The British colonial empire, the French empire, the Dutch empire are basically ruined in disarray. They couldn't hang on to their colonies anymore. And almost all the European colonial possessions, plus the Philippines, which was controlled by the United States, got political independence at that time. India, Pakistan, Korea got independence from Japan, Indonesia, and the rest of them. But the fact that they got out from under colonialism didn't mean that they got out from under imperialism. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah, the first head of independent Ghana, warned that there was this thing called neocolonialism whereby the former colonial powers and their corporations would retain control of their former colonies by economic means even if the flags had changed and there was no longer a colonial government in the colonial capital. But uh, you can interpret Nkrumah's point there as just simply that imperialism continued even in under the disappearance of colonialism. At any rate, uh, as the Cold War developed after World War II, uh, the wealthy capitalist states tended to engage more in direct interventions against any countries where they thought the government might be slipping out from under imperial control, which means out from under the corporations and the US and other uh, rich country interests. 1953, very quickly, the CIA overthrew Dr. Mossadegh, the Prime Minister of Iran, an independently minded Democrat, installed the Shah, uh, and that had to do with the oil interests there. 1954, the Central In Intelligence Agency overthrew Jacobo Arbenz, the President of Guatemala, who had been pushing land reform, which threatened the interests of United Fruit Corporation, the ancestral company to Chiquita Banana, uh, and the uh, U.S. arranged a coup d'etat there, which eventually led to a civil war and the death of at, at least 200,000 people. Uh, next slide, please. 6061, U.S., Belgian, and Imperial agents worked in connivance with right-wingers in the Congo to overthrow uh, the main Congolese national leader, Patrice Lumumba, and destabilize the, the country to the point that there's still bloodshed going on there all these years later, with up to about 5 million people have been, having been killed as a result. 65, the United States helps to bring in a military dictatorship in Indonesia under General Suharto, which looted the country murdered uh, 
half a million to a million people, including most of the communists in Indonesia, and only recently was uh, replaced by a more democratic regime, but still big problems. 1965, the U.S. military directly intervened in the Dominican Republic uh, to prop up a right-wing regime and prevent a left-wing nationalist military officer uh, who had a lot of mass support from taking power. And uh, right from the beginning of the Cuban Revolution, which triumphed on January 1st, 1959, the United States didn't cease until 2014 to try to overthrow the socialist government in that country uh, using an economic blockade, which by the way has not stopped, and engaging in bloody acts of sabotage and terrorism, including 600 attempts to assassinate President Fidel Castro. And there were many, many, many other attempts, but for a long time, many of the countries that wanted to break out from under imperialism saw the Soviet Union and the Eastern European Socialist States as a source of some support at least. But then from 1986 to 1991, the Soviet bloc collapsed. The Soviet Union collapsed, the Eastern European Socialist States all collapsed one after another. So there was no longer anywhere for the poorer countries of the world to turn uh, for credit for economic development help other than to the imperialist states and their instruments themselves. Uh, so at that point, uh, let, let me stop again and ask for questions. Any questions? Let me check the time. Okay. Hearing okay. none. Raphael Stefan Pruns has hand up. Okay. So. Unmute. Raphael, you are now unmuted. Uh, was Stalin an imperialist in any ways? Stalin was a brutal, despotic, and autocratic ruler, but, and he didn't scruple to move in and take over co control of countries he thought were threatening him or, or represented a threat to the Soviet Union. But he wasn't part of this overall corporate structure of imperialism. Uh, on the contrary, he was a, a person that the people in India or, or Africa, wherever, turned to, and then after he, to, to defend themselves against Western imperialism, then after he disappeared, uh, you had uh, his successors, Khrushchev and others, who continued to give some aid, never as much as the people in the poor countries would have liked. In, in uh, uh, opposition to the main imperialist centers. Any more questions? Oh, Pedro has hand up one more time. So, Pedro, your microphone is open. Hearing nothing from Pedro, or okay. it appears that there's no further questions. Okay, but there will be more opportunities for those who couldn't get through uh, as we as we continue. At any rate, so at that point you reach the high point of neoliberal imperialism, which is the phase we're in now. Uh, now there had been neoliberal imperial adventures before. In 1976, uh, the government of socialist president Salvador Allende of Chile was overthrown, and a major role in that was played by the consolidation of the military regime that happened after that was played by uh, the Chicago Boys, uh, economists from the University of Chicago and their followers, <coughs> who experimented with some of the neoliberal uh, policies in Chile that we see more of today. So it wasn't brand new, but it really came into its heyday after the fall of the Soviet Union and Eastern European Socialism. Uh, what is neoliberalism? First of all, it has nothing to do with the usual use we have in the United States of the world. word liberal, by which we, we mean generally somewhat progressive uh, political positions which don't, however, amount to socialism. Uh, it means rather, first of all, free trade, 
which doesn't really mean free trade. It means the ability of major corporations to penetrate everywhere, including especially in the poor countries of the world, without any restrictions. It means deregulation, the elimination of all regulatory laws and mechanisms in the poor countries, including those that protect people's health, the environment, and labor rights on the grounds that this interferes with corporate profit making. Privatization, which means taking what were state enterprises and putting them up for sale, generally to be bought up by transnational corporations for their own profit, but sometimes by the poor country's own elites. Austerity, which means you cut the social welfare budget, housing, health care, etc., down to the bone, and this allows for maximum business profits because of the lower taxes. And it often leads to repression because of the degree to which people will object to this. Uh, now, one of the things that particularly has played a huge role in neoliberal imperialism since the fall of the socialist states of Eastern Europe has been indebtedness. Poor countries, in order to get help in trade and in building their infrastructure and services for their people, have been borrowing money. Uh, and the trouble is that the economic development that results from that model of, of building a country doesn't produce enough money uh, to both pay back the debts and uh, do the other things that any sovereign state needs to do. The result is that today, and for quite a while, the sovereign debts, the national debts that poor countries owe to finance capital, which is where you get these loans, are quite literally unpayable. But if you refuse to pay, you can't get any more credit anymore. So the uh, the uh, debts mount and mount, then you have horrible situations like has happened in Argentina and elsewhere that predatory hedge funds will buy up sovereign debts uh, that are troubled debts at a discount from people who've given up on their, on their investments, then try and get the poor countries to pay back the entire amount uh, of the face value of the debts using all kinds of pressure tactics. This has been done to Argentina, but also to Peru and to Congo Brazzaville. Congo Brazzaville was particularly horrible because it led to loss of money that has, was supposed to be dedicated to health care in that very poor country. They have all sorts of mechanisms of doing this. There's the World Trade Organization, which sets rules of trade that are generally favorable to the rich countries and unfavorable to poor countries and favor major corporations. I can't give you details now, but I strongly recommend that you watch the documentary Life and Debt, which you can find online. It's about how the banana growing industry in Jamaica was destroyed by the World Trade Organization when the United States brought a case against uh, not Jamaica itself, but against Britain which was buying Jamaica's bananas at uh, favorable prices. And the United States said that this was unfair trade practice by Britain because it disfavored Chiquita Banana Dole and other US corporations that grow bananas in Central and South America, paying their workers much less than Jamaican banana workers were getting paid. And the, the WTO, voted in favor of the United States in that, and the result is that the banana trade in uh, Jamaica was, was decimated. There are the International Monetary Fund of the World Bank, make loans and finance development in poor countries, but on condition that the aforementioned neoliberal policies are followed by the governments to whom they're lending money. Uh, and many, many other things. You might look at the international private bond rating, rating agencies, Standard & Poor, Moody's, Fitch, who are the gatekeepers for who uh, they advise people to buy the bonds from. If a country isn't following the neoliberal plan, 
the bond rating agencies will recommend that the, the will will act in such a way that to drive up the cost of borrowing for that country. So that's another way of policing such things. There's still direct intervention. The CIA is still active. Uh, destabilization still goes on. Uh, next, please. And then there are the aid agencies, the USAID, the National Republican Institute, National Democratic Institute, National Endowment for Democracy, all channel charitable funds, so-called, to poor countries, but favoring not-for-profit organizations in those countries that are in line with the priorities of international monopoly capital. And finally, the big corporations acting for themselves, uh, which have, in many cases, corporate incomes that are actually higher than the gross domestic products of many countries in Asia, Africa, and, America, uh, and Latin America. Uh, for instance, Walmart has a higher corporate income per annum than the gross domestic product of a whole series of countries, uh, Peru, very major countries like South Africa and Vietnam. So they have a lot of weight just directly with, without uh, going through government agencies. Uh, we have to see what Trump is going to do about the international trade agreements, but so far the way they have operated is to promote neoliberal imperialism, not the least by investor state dispute settlement mechanisms, whereby corporations from one country can sue the government of a poor country, usually, uh, for activities or laws that that country has passed, which the corporation claims uh, interfere with its future profits. And this is a big fear, this is a big worry in all the poor countries of the world and of organized labor worldwide. So you have direct action by capitalism, but in every case, uh, the action of the state in the wealthy capitalist countries, including the United States, is essential to imperialism. Uh, now, how is imperialism doing? Well, capitalism is not forever. Uh, and it's unstable. The situation I've described is top-heavy. Uh, the, uh, there are crises, the, it's the old, old crisis that Marxism has always described of declining rate of, pro rate of profit and periodic uh, uh, overproduction crises, which still go on. We have the debt crises. We saw what happened worldwide starting in the United States in 2007 and 2008. That has not gone away. The debt continues to pile up and pile up. There's a food sustainability crisis. Uh, countries whose subsistence agriculture has been taken away from growing food crops to other things like mining or, or uh, soybeans for, for export are finding it more and more difficult to feed their people. Public health crises and the big one, the environmental and global warming crisis, which is a product of the current form of capitalist production and is now threatening us all, as we've had a previous class about. So where are we? Slide. Okay, just slip through these. People can take a quick look, but if you want to see this in detail, we can send you copies of the PowerPoint slides. Uh, we're not going to have time to go over these uh, several different uh, uh, indicators of inequality, but it shows you how unequal the, the world has become and continues to be. Uh, impact on infant mortality on the hunger interest. And Oxfam tells us that now just eight individuals worth worldwide have as much wealth as the rest, as 50% of the rest of humanity. So we have a very top-heavy, unstable situation. Poor countries can try to get out from under this by exporting commodities like Venezuela has been doing with oil, but that puts them at the mercy of fluctuating commodity prices. And with a drop in oil prices, Venezuela is really suffering from this right now. And next, 
Next slide, please, sir. Or they can just let throw down their guard and let transnational corporations in. Uh, but that means they have to accept the whole shebang of neoliberal liberal policy requirements. And when will a new road to socialism be found? Uh, that will happen eventually, but we're not at that point now. Now, I think we'll just finish my part and then one or two questions and then go to Sarah. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so how does this affect workers in the United States? Uh, first of all, don't believe the hype that it's a zero-sum game, that people in Mexico are taking their jobs when U.S. move production, the U.S. corporations move production there to take care of cheap labor, because they wouldn't do that if, they, if labor pay were not kept down in Mexico. The workers in poorer countries do better, workers in the United States will do better also. Uh, because the United, what the corporations are doing is playing workers in different countries off against each other. In a globalized economy with massive outsourcing of production, keeping wages low in Bangladesh, a very poor country, hurts workers in the United States. But conversely, if workers in Bangladesh are doing better, workers in the United States will also do better. Next. So, uh, what is the lesson for us that workers in the United States benefit when there's international working class solidarity in which workers here participate? The better workers do in these other countries, the better workers will do in our own country. And I'd like to leave it at that. And just if there are one or two just questions, not comments yet, let's hear them and then I want to go to Sarah and she's going to tell us about the specifics of what's going in Colombia. Okay, everyone, if you would click on your raise hand icon, we can open the microphone and you can ask the question. Your microphone is open again. Can you unmute your computer? Not hearing anything, I'm afraid. Okay, can. Uh, we'll get back to you. Elizabeth Solomon, your microphone is now open. Elizabeth? Uh, I can't see you anymore. It's. Can you put yourself back on the screen? I can see you, Emil. Oh, no, no. Carrie is off the screen while she's moving. Oh, got it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Now, what's, what's the question, Elizabeth? How that's, are you that's doing? That's it. I just couldn't see you. That's all. I'm okay. sorry. I'm going to get put my hand down now. Okay. Best wishes. Hey, next question is Henry Lowendorf. Henry, your microphone is now open, but you have to unmute your computer at your end. Thank you, Emil. That's a wonderful, extremely concise uh, description of. Uh, a little louder, please, Henry. I can't. I can hear your voice, but I can't really hear what you hear. Hear what you're saying. Okay, I'm not sure where the microphone is. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a it's a wonderfully concise presentation of imperialism, because because uh, uh, of the uh, urgency and the dangers that exist right now. Could you say something about uh, the U.S. threatening war with Russia, putting uh, NATO U.S. troops uh, up against its borders? Sure. Uh, well, the NATO situation has always been an imperialist phenomenon. Uh, we shouldn't be distracted by the back and forth between Trump and Putin, nor should we think that Putin is somehow a progressive force. But NATO and also the European Union institutions have always been in a position of, uh, of uh, enforcing imperialist uh, positions there. And let's remember that NATO has gone way beyond Europe and has intervened. Uh, Beyond that, even at one point under the Bush administration, there was talk of NATO intervention in Colombia. I don't think ever anything came over that. But, but uh, you know, that's part of the imperialist structure. The institutions of the European Union have been imposing the same austerity program on the poorer countries of Europe that the that imperialist overall has been imposing for many, many years 
on all the poor countries of the world. And so people are finding out about that too. And now Ukraine is getting the full blast of austerity, privatization, and all of those things, uh, not even being invited into the European Union, but just to have good trading relationships. So we'll see how that turns out in terms of the specifics of US policy, but that's NATO, CETO formally in East Asia and such uh, military alliances are, are an important point, part of this, yes. Any more questions? Okay, next up is David Bart. Your mic should not be in, but you do have to unmute yourself at your computer. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Oh, lovely. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about underdevelopment. Ah, thank you. I, I won't say much because I'm not wanting to take time away from Sarah, who's going to be talking about some of that too, I think. But I, I think you have to understand that underdevelopment is a process, not a, not a original state of the poor countries of the world. Uh -huh. I would advise you to read a wonderful book by Walter Rodney, late Guyanese scholar and activist, called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Uh, okay. It took Africa and didn't try and develop Africa as the apologist for colonialism and imperialism claim, but exploited Africa in such a world way that Africa became more and more underdeveloped. underdeveloped. The same point is made in a lovely book by a Peruvian communist, Carlos, uh, Carlos uh, Marietegui, in his book, Seven Interpretive Essays on Peruvian Re Reality, in which he showed that colonialism in South America uh, didn't come in here and there and help to uplift the Indian or native populations of that country, but that in fact the underdevelopment of the South American countries was precisely due to the colonial and imperial control. In other words, it's an exploited and form of form of control that pushes the countries that are under the boot heel of imperialism into more and more underdevelopment, and it's not a route out of underdevelopment, which I think many, many people realize, but that's not what we're told in this country. I wish I could talk about it more, but that's essentially the the review I think one can take. I think we should stop now and do more questions later, but let's uh, bring uh, Sarah Ladino Caro on uh, to talk to us about the situation in Colombia specifically. Okay, Sarah. Okay, Sarah, we can't see you or hear you. Okay, hi, can, and can everyone hear me now? We hear you, can't see you yet. Okay, just, um, sharing my camera. I don't know why it's not working. Uh, Kerry, should I take my picture off for a second? Should be fine with both of you on. Okay. It sometimes takes a few minutes. Sarah is um, dialing in from quite some ways away, so it may take a while for what them to appear. Meanwhile, if you could continue, Sarah. Yeah, start sure. talking, then when the picture so, comes up, we get to see your face, too. Okay, good. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about the Colombian situation, specifically. And, uh, well, the United States have uh, intervened in, in Colombian politics since the beginning of, of the 60s. Uh, I'll be talking about the intervention from the 60s to the 90s. Uh, to the end of the, oh fuck, se desconectó esta mierda. Yo no sé si se desconectó. Sí, mejor. Sí, yo no sé por qué. Ah. 
Uh, Sarah, can't you just keep on talking and then the technical thing maybe will solve itself? Yes, hi, can everyone hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I don't know why. Oh, because I can't see. I can't see the. Um, you know, I, I just. Well, I'll, I'll just be talking since you can't hear me. But I can't see the. The thing on my on my computer. Okay, so uh, okay, so I'll be just talking about like Colombia, uh, well United States intervention in Colombia. So I'll be talking from the 60s, um, and the pre what we need to take into consideration into consideration is the priorities that Colombia that the United States has um, in Colombia, which is strengthening democratic institutions. Uh, the drug uh, and to eradicate the drug trade and uh, counter and of course uh, it has it has a lot of initiatives on counterterrorism which um, which means counter insurgents Sarah we don't hear you now Did we lose the sound with Sarah? It's showing that we still have Sarah online, but we seem to have lost her microphone and her video feed. So we'll have to continue, and if she can get back on, Sarah, okay. if, you, if you can hear us, just speak up when you get back on. Okay, and we'll just break, go back to you, but, uh, but Carrie, let's finish with this slide that we have up here. At any rate, how to fight imperialism, we call it international working class solidarity. Uh, communists often call it inter, uh, working class internationalism, an old fashioned way, proletarian internationalism, whatever you prefer. But the question is how to do this and how does this work out in the age of Trump? Uh, we have to see what the Trump regime is going to be now. Uh, I wrote these slides before he named his uh, cabinet, but look at what Trump's cabinet is. Uh, the uh, the uh, Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, is from ExxonMobil, one of the biggest and most abusive uh, oil companies, big transnational corporation. Uh, is that man going to run an, a foreign policy that diverges from the goals of international po po uh, uh, ca monopoly capital from imperialism as we've defined it here? I think not. I think that if anything there will be a doubling down on the aggressive presence of monopoly capital in directing U.S. foreign policy. Uh, Goldman Sachs, the uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, is a creature from Goldman Sachs, and there are many, many other Goldman Sachs people, including the main fascist in the, the Trump administration, Bannon, who now is going to have a major security role, which means his hands will be on foreign policy, are Goldman Sachs people. That's a gigantic monopoly finance capital entity with its fingers in every pie worldwide is it going to be a kinder and gentler capitalism, a kinder and gentler imperialism? No, indeed. So when we hear about Trump, oh, and then there's Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, who is, uh, is uh, you know, involved with international mining corporations, extractive industries, who are very bad actors in many parts of the world, especially in Central and South America right now, really brutal alliances with some of the worst right-wing governments you can imagine, and uh, three generals in top positions in Trump's government. Uh, none of them, uh, like Smedley Butler, the Marine general who turned against U.S. imperialism in uh, Central America in the 1920s and, and 30s. So it's an imperialist government in every sense. In fact, you could say that the Trump cabinet and the Trump government as it has developed so far is transnational, neoliberal, monopoly capital, capitalism incarnate. 
it's imperialism of the 20th century incarnate and there's nothing that is good that can be expected of it even though Trump does things like pulling out of the TPP and talking about pulling out of NAFTA he's not going to operate in such a way that allows the poor people in poor countries to get out from under the control of transnational monopoly capital and imperialism because that's who he is. So what are we going to do? It's in the interest of workers in the United States, in fact all people in the United States except the 1%, to be ready to oppose all policies that, that increase inequality, increase instability, increase war, increase lack of independence of the poorer countries because to do so helps our own workers and because of course it's the right thing to do. So how are we going to go about it? How to organize this? And that's what I'd like to put out to our audience tonight. Uh, if Sarah can come back on, we'll hear the rest of her report. Uh, but meanwhile, let's open up for specific questions uh, in a minute. Uh, just do the last slide, please, Carrie. Carrie, the last slide? Okay. How can we do this? What are the practical ways we can now start organizing ourselves to contribute maximally as working people, as ordinary people, as intellectuals, whoever we are in the United States to help the fight against Trumpism as the incarnation of 21st century uh, neoliberal imperialism. And let me just look at, have, let's just have a look at the very last slide in the group. Just one more. And here and on the following one, I have suggested reading. You probably can't get this all down looking at the screen, but as I said, we can send you this list of readings if you just send us a little email uh, requesting it, we'd be glad to send you the whole PowerPoint slide uh, package in an email attachment. Uh, at any rate, uh, let's hear it. What do we do? What is to be done, as Lenin said? What are the steps that we need to follow to fight this monster business of 21st century imperialism that is threatening the whole world as well as people in our own country. Let's hear what some people's contributions, suggestions, and of course questions are. Okay, David Burt, you have your hand up. Uh, David, your mic is now open. Sorry, it turns out that I've never like muted it back. My many apologies. Okay, moving okay. on to Cindy Farquhar. Cindy, you're you have to unmute yourself you're in. Hey Cindy, how are you doing? I'm fine, Emil, and I um thank you for this great work. And um I have an opportunity coming up because I work with a small group on international agriculture and we have put some very high level questions out to um two people at Action Aid and they jumped all over the opportunity and want to come talk to us. So I think they've never had a group be, uh, Action Aid is very much like Oxfam. In other words, there's really not much wrong with their analysis. They're not like USAID at all. Um, they are fighting for um, empowerment of, of, of sovereign nations. Um, so they want to come talk to us and as I said, I don't think there's much wrong with their analysis, so we may be in the situation of just agreeing with each other, agreeing with each other. But then, so my question is, how could this be an opportunity to uh, take something to the next level? Uh, and, and just to be even more clear, this small group is a subcommittee of a League of Women Voters, which has a very... Um, rigid structure. Everything that we decide at a very local level has to be sent all the way up to national and then if they approve it, it gets sent back down and then we're allowed to lobby on it. So it's a very restrictive environment. On the other hand, of course, these women are very good at research and, and, and scrupulous as well. So it has a good side and a bad side. But 
But do you see any kind of an opportunity here when we walk talk with these action aid guys? Yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, uh, the way the Trump administration is moving makes things easier uh, in terms of explaining the world situation and the problems of imperialism to ordinary American people and to activist groups like the League of Women Voters and, and the Action Aid that I hadn't heard of before, but I really would like to know some more about them. And I think when you saw the <clears throat> tremendous outpouring on Saturday the 21st, a protest against Trump, I didn't see anything there that indicates to me that that level of mobilization and activism cannot be turned in the direction of challenging uh, the corporate agenda in foreign policy too. So any and all, every opportunity to uh, build that kind of relationship, networking like crazy and raising the issues everywhere. I think it's very important that all of us uh, bone up on the basic economics of the world right now. I had to do considerable swatting, as they say in England, uh, uh, on economic issues, and I don't feel I did justice to them, imperial, you know, world macroeconomics in this talk, and I hope we can do some more of that. But we need every kind of group involved in, you know, whatever can be accomplished. I also uh, Cindy, you know about the Howard County Latin America group in, in Maryland, right? Uh, yes, anyway, that's another group that I know that you, you do know about. And wherever we go, we should find out what are the groups and organizations that are interested in this kind of solidarity work. But also, it's a terrific chance to work with organized labor, which always has the biggest social base of any kind of organized group because organized labor is more and more seeing how important it is to link up with labor in other countries, especially those countries that are struggling against the abuses of transnational corporations. And it's actually maybe easier in some respect to do this under the realm of Trump than before, because he's managed to antagonize so many sectors of the, you know, so many mass sectors, almost all sectors of labor in the United States uh, will be fighting against Trump and they will be very interested, I think, in talking uh, to labor in other countries and we should be finding ways to do that. Any, any further questions? And thank you for calling in, Cindy. Okay, uh, further questions we have. Next, um, Tony Matheson. Tony, your mic is Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, is Trump a Hitler? And if so, what can the Communist Party do to uh, oppose that? Hitler, I, I didn't understand the question. Is her a version of Hitler? Yeah. Yes or no? And if so, what can the Communist Party do to stop him? Oh, why couldn't the Communist Party stop Hitler in Germany? Is that your question? No, no. No, no, sir. It is Hump a version of Hitler uh, recreated? And if so, what can the Communist Party do to stop him? Well, we don't know what Trump is going to be. You've got to understand there are many forms of Trump, of fascism. Uh, Hitler came to power with the support not only of his own Nazi party, but of uh, various uh, right-wing groups, some of them who were smart alex from industry and the landed aristocracy and army who thought that they could control him. And of course, uh, they were wrong about that. So you've got various different kinds of groups. But I think uh, Trump is a real danger. I think whatever you would call him, uh, he has people in the wings who are very much, much uh, definitely fascists by definition. And uh, so, yes, there's a very real danger. And the Communist Party can't stop him alone, but uh, only if we generate mass opposition to him and his policies that is of such a scale that we can back him down. 
and there are good signs as well as bad. First of all, he didn't win um, either a majority or plurality of the popular vote. Secondly, there is strong opposition to some of his worst policies. Uh, uh, for instance, he just uh, introduced these horrible restrictive policies or pressure policies against Muslim immigrants and visitors or people from certain countries and not others. And you saw that immediately there were big protests in a number of major airports around the country, lawsuits filed, more protests to come. So mass unity, reaching out to every possible constituency who's hurt by the policies that Trump and the Republicans are going to impose, uh, can build a gigantic united front uh, that can stop him, uh, at, but only with very hard work on the part of all of us. But the communists can't do it alone. Uh, they couldn't do it in, in Germany, even though the, it was a much, communism was a much bigger movement in Germany in the 1930s than it was, that it is here mm -hmm. now. Uh, anyway, listen, I'm seeing Sarah's picture coming up. There you are. Hi, I'm sorry. I was having a lot oh, of trouble oh, with Well, with we're here to you now. Why don't you, you go ahead with your presentation? Sure. I don't know how much okay, time so we have left. I think oh. I can take like a couple of minutes. Yes. Maybe like, yeah, okay. Okay, so I was saying that, okay, I'm going to be talking about the United States inter intervention in Colombia. And, uh, well, in Colombia, there has been a lot of uh, military initiatives and efforts from, from the United States in order to uh, fight counter, to, like, to, yeah, to fight uh, terrorism, uh, which, which is, a, which is a insurgency from guerrilla groups and other uh, insurgent groups. Uh, so it starts from the 60s, and uh, right after La Violencia, which was a peer, peer, period in, uh, in Colombian history in which uh, conservatives and liberals uh, were fighting uh, for, to, get, to get the uh, political power and to actually uh, take over the government. And uh, so there was a lot of uh, contention and there was a lot of violence in uh, in different towns and, and cities, but mostly in rural are areas. And uh, after a the signing of uh, El Frente, Frente Nacional, uh, it's uh, like National Front, uh, there was a uh, compromise by uh, conservatives and liberals to stop the, this violence, and, and it actually ended up in a uh, switch, so like swift, uh, swifting of power uh, among uh, them and among conservative and liberal um, uh, leaders, and so this right after this, right after La Violencia, right after the uh, Liberal Front, the uh, National Front, Frente Nacional, um, there was a uh, beginning of counterinsurgency and of counterterrorism, which was which was uh, supported by the U.S. So in the, in 1962. Uh, there was a, a plan call, called El Plan Lazo, at which, which began in 1962 and went all the way to 1965. And there was massive military assault on independent republics, on independent peasant republics, on the um, on the east side of Col no wait, uh, yeah, east side, east south of Colombia. Uh, so there was a, a big uh, or a, an important peasant republic called in, in La Marquetalia, and uh, it was a plan called Plan Marquetalia. There was a lot of military um, uh, military efforts and uh, massacres, and uh, and it was it was actually uh, being uh, supported by the, by the U.S. government. Um, then it was a rise in power in, uh, in the 80s. There was a, a rise on on paramilitarism, and this paramilitarism uh, was backed by the U.S. There was uh, there's a specific group that, that I could found. It was called the uh, MAS M A S, and uh, it was a coalition of drug traffickers and ranchers and businessmen and uh, and and the Sacco, uh, officials. And uh, so the 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 the, the, the MAS, which was a 
paramilitary group was trained by the School of the Americas and there, there was also a lot of other groups, paramilitary and military in Colombia, that, that were trained by the, by the School of the Americas. That's why many people uh, from Latin America knows that the School of the Americas should be, uh, I mean, it was, it was good that they, they were shut down finally. It was basically uh, a counterinsurgency argument, but it was real. It was really to uh, pursue um, the opposition to the government and to pursue uh, left-leaning um, movements and groups. And so then there was uh, there was also in uh, in 1985. It was uh, during the era of paramilitarism and drug trafficking. That in in eight, 1885 and 1890 there was a genocide of the UP. This is the pa the patriotic the patriotic union. And it was a political party that was created by the uh, that was um, that was founded uh, after the FARC um, came into an agreement with the government to demobilize and to start uh, to start a a political movement instead of an armed move instead of an armed movement. And uh, so, right after the the UP was founded, there was a genocide. There was from 3,000 to 4,000 UP members that were killed, and uh, then between 1984 uh, and, uh, and, and 1990, uh, there was 4,800 uh, 4, military personnel training in the in the S and the School of the Americas. So you can see like how how the US was really uh, giving support to the to Colombia in order to um, to to to, to uh, fund this um, counter insurgency efforts and uh, all these counter uh, terrorism uh, efforts, and in, then the last one that I wanted to mention, which is really that that may, I I can well I, I I could see in the U.S. that many people have heard of is Plan Colombia, and it was it began in 1999. It was a mil military support, and uh, it. it it, it ranged from a, a support in from from six to nine billion dollars, and uh, it was uh, it was to support again the military, also to support paramilitary forces in Colombia, and to and this uh, forces these military and paramilitary forces targeted uh, opposition, targeted uh, left uh, left movements, targeted uh, also peasant movements, as well as um, working um, workers uh, unions and and others, and and now we are facing uh, we are facing a new era. I, I mean, from 1999, from Plan Colombia till the the, the um, beginning of the the second millennium, um, there was uh, there was there was a lot of massacres. There was a lot of killings of leaders, uh, activists, and uh, it was. It was uh, support, and it was funded. It was also f uh, funded by the U.S. And now um, we are we are having a peace deal with the count with the, with the insurgency, with the FARC specifically, which is the largest guerrilla group in the, in Colombia. And uh, the U.S. has has been really like it hasn't been really supportive of the peace talks because at one uh, at first uh, the peace talks wanted. Uh, uh, they wanted to hold the talks in New York, and since the U.S. had the FARC in their uh, in their list, I think is their uh, their their uh, terrorist list, um, so they they couldn't go. And uh, now Obama, very very recently, uh, he uh, um, took the FARC out of this list, and so now we don't know what's the the position of of the U.S. And the peace talks, but the peace talks, the, the peace talks that are now happening in Colombia are a big step toward uh, peace and toward uh, uh, you know a nation, a nation that is not uh, um, pregnant by violence and massacres and genocides. And um, and now we are just waiting on on Trump, Trump's presidency. We uh, we hope that he doesn't uh, take like um, he doesn't take the FARC. Back again to the least, and um, and and there was also a uh, a um, 
budget that was that was being given to the to this peace talks and to this process to this peace process. We know what's going to happen with Trump, but we we are we are really aware that the U.S. it's a, it's an important um, actor and it's an, it's, an, it's a really important uh, nation in in Latin America, and that's why we're really looking into what's going on in 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 the U.S. right now. And and as we could see from the history of of Colombia, the U.S. hasn't been really uh, supportive of uh, of um, of you know of, of like renewal um, political uh, movements or of a or of a peace um, or, or, or of a peace in Colombia. So we're just we're just gonna wait on like what's gonna happen right now with Trump. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you, Sarah. I have a question for thank Sarah. You. Uh, or let me just clarify for the rest of the audience that when you refer to the FARC, you're referring to the Fuerzas Armadas de la Revolución Colombiana, which is the largest armed guerrilla group in the country. And uh, when you talk about the list, you're referring to the U.S. Uh, government's official list of uh, terrorist organizations. And uh, uh, Obama took uh, Colombia, took the FARC off the, that list as a, as a contribution to helping with the uh, negotiation of peace between the FARC and uh, President Manuel Santos of Colombia. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's what that's about. But there's the second group, which is the, what, the Ejército de Liberación Nacional, do I get that right? Is yeah. that still, is that going to be in the peace negotiation as well? Yeah, well, it's a different peace deal. It's a different peace uh, talk talks, but uh, now they're starting to have talks in uh, Ecuador. But then there was a um, there was a uh, leader, a political leader, from I think uh, the coast of Colombia, and so he was being held by the by the ELN, Ejército de Liberación Nacional, and uh, so then the government was saying that. Until his liberation, the government is not going to go to talks with this group because you know they have um, they have the um, they have this leader um, kidnapped. So if they don't liberate them, if they don't liberate him, they're not going to go to talks. But I have I haven't heard uh, a lot more on that. But I know that uh, they they were going to start in Ecuador in Quito, but it didn't happen because the government said that they have to liberate this leader. Yeah. Wow, well, scary situation, folks. Uh, many thanks to Sarah from the Colombian Students Group at Hunter College, New York, and from the YCL in New York City. Thank you. Uh, speaking from Colombia, their country of origin. Uh, and that's just one of the great many situations that we have to watch carefully as the Trump administration uh, develops whatever it's going to develop and we're not optimistic, you know, what will be the relationship between Trump and ex-president Uribe in Colombia, who's another extreme right-wing character con connected to the most right-wing in the, you know, the, the power military groups that Sarah mentioned before. And uh, what will the oil industry be doing in Colombia? We have to watch that a little bit. Colombia is not the biggest oil country, but I think Colombia has some oil, right? Some oil, um, not 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 that much. Not that it much. has a lot of, of minerals, and and I was actually also reading that the um, the U.S. supported all these counterinsurgency efforts because it had it had a lot of uh, um, benefits, or it had, it had a lot of uh, pri uh, priorities, or yeah, it has it had a lot of priorities in mining and gold mining and mineral mining uh, primarily. Yeah, so that's that's the primarily. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll keep watch on that. We'll rely on you, Sarah, and then Tom Whitney and other people who've been watching the Columbia situation so carefully for all of us uh, to keep us posted. Let's go back to questions from the audience now for both Sarah and for me. Carrie, are there any more questions? Yes, we have several hands raised. Uh, okay. Sue Gutierrez. Gutierrez. Um, your mic is open, but you have to unmute it at your end. Ciro Gutierrez. 
Okay, you, you do have to unclick at your computer. Okay, here is the thing. Get back to your next and list. Elizabeth Solomon. Elizabeth, your mic is open. Hey, Elizabeth. Can't hear you. You have to click on the little uh, uh, video cam icon. Okay. Okay, we're going to mute Elizabeth and move on to Henry Lohndorf. Henry Lohndorf, your mic is now open. Henry, hey, uh, Emilio had asked for some suggestions regarding how to fight imperialism. I'm going to make two. One, one is uh, to support a bill that uh, uh, Hawaiian Representative Tulsi Gabbard has introduced into the House called Stop Arming the Terrorist Act. It's HR 258. It would prevent the United States. Would you get the number again? HR what? 258. 258. 258. Okay, got it. Yeah. Barbara Lee is a co sponsor. It's bipartisan, the Republicans. It's basically prevent the United States government from arming and funding terrorists around the world as it has been doing, and as U.S. citizens are not allowed to do. So it basically makes the government responsible as its citizens are, not to be supporting terrorists. Um, the second is that uh, the uh, Cuban Peace Council is, uh, is sponsoring a, um, a uh, seminar in uh, Guantanamo in early May or late April. I don't have the exact dates. Uh, to uh, end the, end the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, colony uh, at the Guantanamo base, to close that base down and turn it back over to Cuba, but also to close the 800 or so U.S. military bases around the world. And this is something that the uh, U.S. peace movement and, uh, and uh, the party ought to be involved in. Mm -hmm. Okay, the number of U.S. bases around the world, I wish I could have found a graphic, but it's shocking. It's incredible, the number of bases that have continued to grow. So I thank can, you very much. I can send you a graphic from uh, uh, Bruce Gagnon's organization that it's a map, actually, of the world with uh, uh, a it's bunch of points on it. I'll send that to you. Okay, thank you. Sarah, any comments for Henry? Yeah, actually, just then about the um, U.S. bases, military bases, just in Colombia, I was reading there was um, above, wait, yeah, yeah, above 70 uh, military bases in Colombia since the since the 80s, um, with all the support of Plan Colombia, uh, the the military bases have started to um, increase a lot. Ecuador kicked out the U.S. military base in Manta. Uh, that was one of the things that greatly annoyed President Bush about uh, Rafael Correa's government there. And one of the dynamics historically behind uh, U.S. imperial destabilization efforts in Latin America, but not only in Latin America, has been resistance to the presence of U.S. military bases. You know, and it's, our party has always been against that kind of uh, military bases uh, all over the place, but I think we probably need to talk and write about it more and do more, especially in, in terms of that. So thank you, Henry, for bringing that up. Okay, next we have Stephen Valencia. Stephen, your mic is now open. Okay, can, you, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sada and uh, Emil, for a tremendous report here this evening. Uh, you know, here in, uh, I'm in Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, and we have a school called the Salt of the Earth Labor College. And, uh, Salt de la Tierra. I've been there. Wonderful. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, we, we have the good fortune of having um, a, uh, a steelworker leader. Uh, District 12 leader um, Bob LaVenture coming to speak about international uh, solidarity and uh, you know as as we know 
um, you know, the Los Mineros de Mexico, Los Mineros in other countries here in the United States as well, especially in Arizona, are, are struggling against uh, Grupo Mexico, that other transnational corporation. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fierce fight and it's something that uh, we have to find ways how to win this thing. So um, that's a question um, that I have for, for Sara and, and yourself, Emil. Any, any suggestions that we could um, refer to in this class coming up this Saturday um, at, uh, here in Tucson? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I'm sure you're in contact with Scotty Marshall, who's been working with the Mineros, the Mine and Metal Workers Union of Mexico, which is a union that broke with the right-wing patterns of Mexican labor and has been severely chastised and punished. But, Steve, is there any possibility you could get Brother Gomez Urrutia uh, to speak to you long distance at that class. He's still in Canada as far as I know. He writes columns regularly in La Jornada, the left-wing Mexico City daily. Uh, Napoleon Gomez Urrutia is the head of the Mexican Mine and Metal Workers Union. He's driven out of the country by repression by the Mexican government because he took stands that were independent of what the government and the industries in Mexico wanted. And by the way, you bring up Grupo Mexico, uh, and I should mention that what 21st century neoliberal imperialism has created is also major monopoly capital entities that are not based in the wealthy countries, but that represent the ruling classes of some of the poorest countries themselves. In Mexico, there are several of these. Uh, uh, Grupo Mexico is one of them. In Mexico, there's metal steel, in, in India, I'm sorry, metal steel and others like that. So while the political control of imperialism is still basically in the old wealthy capitalist countries, you have growths or like metastasized cancer of, of uh, monopoly imperialistic corporations in the other countries as well. There are probably some in California. But what do you think, uh, Steve? Would it be of interest to try and contact Gobos uh, Urrutia? It would be tremendous uh, if, if that could happen and have him call in uh, in a way where, you know, the folks uh, in the class could actually hear it. You know, I'm not too sure the technical part. I'm not all that technical. Uh, be short but... notice. Might be a little short notice maybe for the future, but ask Scott Marshall about that. He probably has the contacts to, to do that, but, you know, you have steel worker contacts already, so you could raise it directly with the steel, our steel workers union. Yes, absolutely, and thank you so much for that uh, suge uh, suggestion. And I know that the, uh, the steel workers uh, have been involved in labor movement in Colombia uh, around the Coca-Cola, um, you know, campaigns. And, uh, you know, they, uh, they spoke a lot about it here, uh, about the, the terrible uh, experiences of the trade union leaders in Colombia during those campaigns. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really um, frightening what they have done. So anyway, thank you so much, Sada and Emil, for, for your presentations tonight. And, and I'll, uh, I'll get in touch with the steelworkers and see if uh, uh, Gomez, and Senor Gomez, could, uh, could be a part of the class on Saturday. Thank you. Great. Sara, anything to add to? Mm -hmm. to no, I think I think I think that was good, and I like that that he mentioned that Steve. What's what's your name? Yes, yeah, Steve Valencia. Steve Valencia. Okay, it was. Um, I liked it when you mentioned the the Coca Cola, uh, resistance because it was really big, and uh, they 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 never got they never get like a lot of uh, media uh, coverage. So it's good to to take in uh, to take into into considerations all these movements that are really happening. Around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Steve. More questions? Okay, next in line we have Ryan Schreiber. Ryan, your mic is now Thank open. You. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you, Emil, and thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> I had a question about. Um, when you were talking about 
how the um, keep, keeping jobs within the United States and um, you know uh, the Donald Trump's um, you know message to his base about keeping jobs in the United States and uh, keeping jobs that he believes should be United States jobs out of Mexico. Um, I had questions about how that relates to um, uh, how exactly would that um, de like further destabilize the United States and Mexico, and also is that a is that an example of um, uh, underdeveloping Mexico? Uh. To your second question, yes. In other words, when NAFTA, what we're talking about NAFTA, is the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is the big trade treaty between the United States and Mexico, and when it was being debated in the late 80s and early 1990s, it was solidly opposed by labor in Canada and the United States. It was solidly opposed by the Marxist and socialist left in Mexico, Canada, and the United States because it was seen as the prime example of the moment of exactly what we're talking about tonight, namely aggressive neoliberal imperialism, that who would benefit from this would be corporate money bags and not workers in any country. In Mexico, because of the lack of freedom of the Mexican trade unions under the sum of the government of the free, the Revolutionary Institutional Party, uh, which is much more institutional than revolutionary, uh, most of the unions in Mexico didn't say anything. Whatever they thought about it, they didn't come out openly against it, but left-wing independent unit, unions in Mexico also opposed it. In Mexico, on um, January 1st, 1994, there was an armed rebellion of Native American people in the Mexican, southernmost Mexican state of Chiapas, the Zapatista Rebellion, because they saw and predicted correctly that NAFTA would flood Mexico with cheap U.S. grain, uh, corn and uh, maize and, and wheat and other farm products, cheap because we, the United States taxpayers, subsidized that stuff. And that this would drive food, <coughs> basic food farmers off the land all over Mexico, which it did to the tune of about 5 million people. That those people would be driven into the cities where they'd become a cheap labor source for U.S. corporations, which would then shut down here, leaving workers in the street in the United States and go and get the cheap labor in Mexico. So they were against that. but. In the intervening 20 years, the Mexican and U.S. economies have been totally entangled. And so for Trump to unilaterally walk out of NAFTA and just say we're going to start slapping 20% or 35% tariffs on Mexican imports to the United States will not help workers in Mexico. It will make them poorer. What needs to happen with NAFTA is it needs to be renegotiated but who needs to be at the negotiating table is workers from all three countries. And I doubt if the governments of the United States under Trump and uh, Mexico under Peña Nieto are going to facilitate that. So what I suspect Trump is going to do is to try and force Mexico to make even bigger concessions to U.S. corporations. And I hope that Mexico takes a stand against that, but I'm not optimistic when I watch the behavior of the current uh, Mexican president. So yeah, I think it's a, the result of what Trump is doing on NAFTA will make people in Mexico poorer, which will only benefit multinational corporations, nobody else. So we shouldn't jump on the bandwagon and then say, oh, what a great thing he's doing, he's gonna cancel NAFTA or something. It could be backfiring. I have an article, of, by the way, I wrote on this about a week and a half ago in People's World, which you can find there. Oh, uh, where can I find that? On peoplesworld.org. Look it up under Kerry. Uh, what should they, he look under there? Probably it's not on the front page anymore. Look it up under my name, 
uh, and NAFTA, and it should come up. Okay. Well, thank and you so much. You, you're, you're welcome. Thank you for calling in and for your good, very good question. Okay. Uh, Sarah, anything else? Um, no, I think I think it was good. I think your intervention, your answer was really good, <laughs> very complete. Okay, our webinar is now one and a half hours long. Uh, shall we take time for a few remaining questions? A couple more, sure. I can stay, sure. I can you stay for a little? Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's find someone who hasn't spoken before. David Bart, your hand is up. David Bart, your mic is open. Ah, uh, yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Great. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Reserve Army of Labor and how NAFTA makes use of the increased number of workers to uh, basically break the strength of the labor unions here in the U.S. and in Mexico and prevent us from being able to better organize for improved working conditions. Oh, what a good question. Thank you so much for asking that. The Reserve Army of Labor, who for those of you who don't know the Marx terminology, means that the large numbers of unemployed and underemployed people initially in a given country are used as a mechanism by capitalism to pull down the wages and worsen the working conditions, weaken the labor bargaining power of those workers who have regular jobs. So there's always a high level of unemployment and the employers, if you wake up a big capitalist boss in the middle of the night by shaking him and saying, hey, what's the, do you like unemployment? And he say, yeah, unemployment is great because it helps us to control wage demands of employed workers. Now, with corporate globalization, this is worldwide. Basically, potentially the whole population of all the poor countries in the world and now the World Reserve Army of Labor for major corporations of every, every kind, industrial and also service corporations. Uh, look at how this works with Walmart, how the, the uh, how, uh, you know, uh, not only it impacts the service workers in Walmart, Walmart stores in the United States, but also people working in industry when the pressure is put on uh, workers in countries that are producing goods to be sold at Walmart to keep their wages low. This is all over the country now, and I think you might be interested in reading uh, a book. I don't like to advertise books because many people don't have a way of getting hold of them, but in the list of, uh, of readings that's up on the screen now, the first two readings, uh, a whole edition of Monthly Review magazine called The New Imperialism, Globalized Monopoly Ca Finance Capital. Several of the articles in that talk about how the globalization of production pulls down uh, wages worldwide and helps to control the working class in all countries. And uh, the book by John M. Smith that follows goes into that in book length. You won't necessarily agree with all of these articles. I don't. But I think that the way they talk about the use of globalization of labor and of globalization of production to control wages, even in wealthy countries like the United States, is really illustrative. And it shows you once again why it is so much in the interest of workers in a country like the United States, in a country like Britain, in a country like Japan, France, Germany, etc to be 100% in support of the labor struggles of the workers in countries like Mexico, Bangladesh, uh, Colombia, and so on. But yes, it's, uh, the, Reserve Arbor, the Reserve Army of Labor has been spread to an unprecedentedly high global level under the 2017 vintage uh, neoliberal imperialism. Thank you. Sarah, anything on that? Uh, Carrie, maybe we take one more question. Okay. Norma uh, has spoken. Norma Harrison, our microphone is. 
now open. I, I thought maybe you might like to add in the uh, meaning of the falling rate of profit ex to explain how uh, capitalism works or doesn't work actually. <laughs> <laughs> you got me there. Uh, my economics background is very weak. Oh. But, but basically, let me just say, and the economists can, can jump on me if I get this wrong, that capitalism, well, Marx's explanation is that as capitalism develops, uh, living capital gets outweighed by dead capital, namely equipment and machinery. That capitalists can't make money off the dead capital. That leads to the falling rate of profit. But I was actually referring more to this, uh, which is that as capitalists keep workers' wages down and constantly seek to, uh, to uh, find cheaper and cheaper find cheaper and cheaper labor, cheaper and cheaper ways of making the profit, that in fact what they're doing is, and they can't help it, is undercutting the possibility of selling their products. In other words, you see this particularly in a poor country like Colombia, like South Africa, Mexico, and so on. You know, if you're paying people sub-minimum wages, who is going to buy your product? All right? And we see this even in a rich country like the United States. It's one of the arguments for fighting for an increased minimum wage is how do businesses expect people to buy their products if nobody has any money in their pockets because they're being underpaid. Well, and but that, if they get raised wages, then they raise, they raise the rent, they raise the price of milk, they raise all the rest of the prices. So. It's always a, a losing battle. Yes, it's their eventual doom. The two things that doom capitalism in the, uh, the eyes of uh, basic Marxist theory is, first of all, that race that cannot be won, except right. by the whole thing falling apart and revolution overthrowing the capitalist system. Right. And the other thing is the growth of the working class, uh, the growth of the proletariat, the working class numerically and eventual resistance. But there's a warning here, which is, comes from our good friend Rosa Luxemburg. Remember her? <laughs> the leader of the German Communist Movement who was murdered by the Kaiser's demobilized officers in 1919. Her watchword was careful socialism or barbarism. Yeah, right. Because as capitalism goes to the wall, what could happen is that it plays its last card, which is brutal and violent. Fascism, fascism. It can do that if the working class isn't prepared to, to resist to, to the ultimate. And can we ask ourselves, is the working class of the United States ready, you know, for that eventuality? And I think the, that uh, that's a very serious warning to us. Anyway, so that's a very good question. And maybe we'll have some basic economics courses in the series subsequently, and somebody can give you a better answer than I just did. Right. I was just reading in a monthly review, a uh, review in, uh, talking about Istvan Mezaris, and he's... Uh, right, talking, yes, Hungarian economist, Istvan Mezaris, right, right. right. And he's saying, you know, that the overthrow of capitalism doesn't really have a lot of meaning. He's talking about something called substantial democracy as opposed to talking about... Um, direct democracy or representative democracy, he's gone to substantial democracy. And mm -hmm. this, of course, I think means everybody's really got to be thrown in together to stop the system the way it is, because it's so entrenched. Uh, at least that's, that's what I picked up out of it. But he did say that uh, no longer does the phrase overthrow capitalism work or and now he says that we're not talking about capitalism or barbarism. We're talking about, gee, we even prefer to have barbarism instead of what's coming down the pike. Well, when you throw in the global warming crisis and all of the other crises I just right. skimmed over in this talk, that I think he's right. You know that that 
not only will capitalism be in danger of destroying itself and maybe move to a fascist phase to prevent that, but capitalism is in danger of destroying life on Earth. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so there'll be many, as many, we know it. Yeah. many, many life forces. On Earth as we, life on Earth as we know it. <laughs> yeah. Or any life on Earth. Anyway, thank you. Uh, are there any more comments, Sarah? Is there anything else you'd like to add at this point? No, I'm fine. We can. Are we going to take more questions? Or the webinar is now an hour and forty minutes long. We are well past the scheduled end of our webinar. Uh, there yeah. are a couple of raised hands yet, and there is a uh, one particular question written: Do protests help, and if so, how? By Jay Bolton. Sarah, what is actually no longer on? <laughs> So, it looks like we don't have any questions from anybody that has not yet spoken. Would you care to take a couple of more? Sarah, can you take more? I can. I don't have yeah. a personal yeah, life. <laughs> okay, Raphael Stefan Pons, you're on the line. Your mic is open. Um. Uh, a good thing to fight against imperialism would possibly be working with other communist and workers parties like the Socialist Workers Party, Workers World, and Party for Socialism and Liberation. The more that we work with other communist parties could uh, get uh, communism on the scene and it, it be recognized as an anti-imperialist force. What are your thoughts on this? Uh not against it, I think for maximum unity. We work with some of the groups you mentioned in United Front coalitions, for instance, and Cuba Solidarity work. I would just add that you have to go way beyond consciously communist, socialist, or Marxist groups to get the unity that you need. You need to work with labor. You especially need to work with those forces that are big mass followings. The unions, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the environmentalist movement, the indigenous rights movement, lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, transgender movements, women's rights movement. The good example of what we need to aim for was what happened on Saturday in downtown Washington, D.C., Saturday last, downtown Washington, D.C. You know, this is, this is going to require millions and millions and millions, and it can't be just the conscious left that's, that's involved. But, yes, uh, unity is... is a very important thing. Okay. Sorry. Well, I would just say uh, in Colombia, the left is also very weakened, uh, just as in the U.S. I mean, they have different histories and, and everything, but yeah, the main uh, strategic uh, strategy that uh, we, the people is using in Colombia, is to have a broad front, just as Emil said, and yeah, unity is really important. The left, we we also must. I think we must take into into consideration how weakened the left is, and how how we need to expand our um, visions and our uh, unions to other sectors of the of society, not just the left. Okay, few more hands raised yet. Elizabeth Solomon, one more time. Elizabeth, your microphone is open. Okay, hearing no answer from Elizabeth. Let's move on to David Bart once more. David, your mic is open, but you have to unmute it at your end. Hello again. Uh, the current political situation, and by that I don't just mean at the U.S. national level, I mean globally, uh, worries me. In fact, it reminds me a lot of William Butler Yeats's poem, The Second Coming. When you look at AFD in Germany, when you look at Marine Le Pen in France, we live in scary times. Um, and unfortunately, these days, we don't have the support of a superpower like the USSR to counteract any of that. Um, I guess what I'm asking 
for here is a little bit of hope. Uh, can you offer me anything to hold on to uh, when I'm looking at the struggle for workers' rights in the face of what looks like a blood dim tide of fascism? You're another Yates fan, the rough beast slouching towards Bethlehem to be born. Is that what you're referring to, I think? That's the one. Uh, that's a uh, rough beast with on orange colored hair. Uh, things fall apart, the center doesn't hold. Yes, it's a very scary moment, but all I can say is, although it sounds trite, look at the look at the uprising of the people. Every single, single thing so far that Trump has been doing has been pushed back. And this is happening in other countries too, even though there's a lot, strong right-wing movement in many, many places. Look at Poland. Not long ago, uh, an effort by the ultra-right-wing Polish government to impose a very ultramontane Catholic Church doctrine on women's rights on the whole country. They were backed down by a women's rebellion in Poland, which was the last place you'd expect to be seeing progressive politics right now. So all we can do is keep pushing for the unity of the 99% against the 1%. And please remember, since you're a poetry fan, Shelley's phrase uh, about the workers arising, which was recited by Karl Marx's daughter, uh, Eleanor, in the first big May Day demonstration ever in England, uh, the presence of the elderly Engels. Rise like lions after slumber in unconquerable number. Shake off your chains like morning dew. Ye are many, they are few. Okay, with that, I think we can um, call it into the webinar tonight. This is the end of imperialism in the 21st century and the Trump webinar. Thank you everyone for attending and for participating. And especially thank you, Emil and Sarah. Thank you.